Is that all right? We are just, I think, I hope we have blast off. Well, I hope we don't blast off, but I think we are connected now, which we weren't a minute ago when I first tried to come on. So I think quite a few of you know that this is my birthday and it's my 75th birthday. And when I look back to my 70th, I cannot, you know, I just don't know where the five years have gone. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a mathematical explanation for why time passes, seems to pass more quickly the older you get. I don't know if this has been proven, but one of my grandsons who thinks very mathematically suggested this. Five years in my lifetime is only a 15th of my life, so really quite a short time. Whereas when he turns 20 next year, five years will have been a quarter of his lifetime, so quite a big chunk. Don't know if anyone out there knows whether that theory has been proved, but anyway, the five years since we celebrated, we celebrated our 140th and hadn't decided, thankfully, how to celebrate our 150th because this will be a very low key affair. But thanks to technology and having one another, I will still be having a lovely day. And for our own people in Blackburn, the heating which is still on and it needs to be turned off because of the noise has been effective. And of course, as people in Blackburn will know, we didn't have a horribly cold winter's night. Um, so the heating is just about to be totally switched off and Graham will take over. God bless you all. Well, thank you, Christine, and uh, happy birthday. I didn't know you were going to mention your birthday. <laughs> Ooh, yes. So, and welcome uh, to Blackburn Presbyterian Church this 9th of August. My name is Graham, I'm the minister, and this is our 20th Sunday uh, streaming uh, on Sunday mornings. You may be here directly via Facebook, uh, and we encourage you to leave comments if you've come through the website. Uh, you may also have discovered that the website also has our weekly leaflet on it. Uh, this is that leaflet for this week, and uh, you can download it and learn a little bit about the church from the, website, from the leaflet and the website. And uh, you'll also find sermon notes in here, so what I'm going to say this morning is condensed into small print, but here in, in the leaflet. My email and phone are there as well if you want to make contact about anything. This morning uh, I intend to start a new series of ser sermons uh, on great texts of the Bible. I'm, and I've used as the uh, uh, symbol of this morning's service uh, the, the Sagrada Familia, the uh, great uh, work of uh, architecture that's uh, being constructed in Barcelona. Uh, Anton Gaudi started it more than 100 years ago. And... Uh, it's being continued to complete his work uh, at the moment using the amazing high technology. It's amazing from an architectural and construction point of view, but it's also amazing because it's a, it's a church in which the whole Bible is being communicated. That's what he wanted, the message of the Bible to come uh, into stone so that people could be awed by that great story, which is what I'm thinking of as we turn to great texts of the Bible. So this morning I'm going to lead you in prayer and then we're going to have a short time of reflection. Uh, let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for a quiet time in the week, especially during this pandemic when we can think about you, your word, your love revealed in the Lord Jesus and your purpose in our lives. We often don't see it. It's so hard. But we know you have a purpose, and it's a good purpose, and that you're working it out. Please speak to us this morning and draw near to us wherever we are. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, 
uh, Amanda is going to play for us, uh, London Derry Air, but I thought I'd, I'd read you some new words. It's very hard when you hear this beautiful melody not to think of a familiar, a familiar Irish song, but I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that it's in our hymn book, to the, to the hymn I Cannot Tell, and the first verse goes like this. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship should set his love upon the sons of men, or why, as shepherd, he should seek the wanderers to bring them back. They know not how nor when. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship. Let's listen to Amanda playing London Derry Air. The power of music. Beautiful. Thank you, Amanda. Now to find my notes, not Graham's. Everything okay, Graham? <laughs> Graham jumps up and looks at the camera, at the phone, and I think, oh, what's wrong? Well, I have to confess that this week I struggled to find a topic for Young at Heart. Other weeks, starting way back now with Florence Nightingale, always something grab my interest that I thought I'd like to share. And then I realised that the topic was staring me in the face, quite literally. I think in Victoria, and perhaps even in New South Wales, if at the moment you asked any school child to give you a five-letter word beginning with M and ending with S, they would very quickly come up with masks. 
absolutely mandatory. I believe in Scotland too, once you're out of your home. Certainly in Victoria, when you are out of your home and in parts, they're being encouraged in New South Wales, I think. There's been, this has been a slow development, much, much slower than the virus, because at first people weren't, weren't sure whether anyone apart from medical workers needed them. Then gradually it became, well, perhaps, and then which mask, for whom, and does any face covering do? So it's a whole lot, and I'm sure you've all seen it on the news. We saw quite an extended section on masks that are being made for people to look attractive with a mask covering half their face. And the National Gallery of Victoria has begun sending subscribers or members of the gallery images of some of the many works that people have featured people wearing masks. And if you go on the NGV website, if you're looking for something to look at in lockdown in Melbourne, you'll find heaps of these photos. And they say, across history, masks have long held an important role as modes of self-expression, cultural tradition, protection. And, and I'm hoping this will work. Could you just check, Graham? We have a very old mask, which we believe, oops, sorry, originated in Venice. People used to think it was fun to wear masks for all sorts of occasions, sometimes even to mask balls. I have never, be, I used to love dancing, but I have never ever felt like dancing with someone I didn't know who it was. Maybe they really knew anyway. But back to August the 9th, 2020 in Melbourne. Now, there's been quite a bit of discussion about whether this mask is better or more necessary than this mask. And I'm not entering into that. One's the 95, one's just the plain blue one. Our oldest granddaughter, who's very good at craft things, decided she would start wearing masks, making masks, not start wearing. So, here is the one she designed and made for me. I hope it is visible. And of course, for her grandfather, I said a more sedate one. So we have this sort of pale navy blue. Anyway, there's also been a lot of discussion about how to wear a mask. And I won't try to put one on, but you know, Officially, you should have it covering your mouth and your nose. And mostly, when we go walking, that's exactly what we see. Even people with takeaway coffee are rushing to get home because they know they can't stop and drink their coffee through their mask. Sometimes you see some people who've got it covering their mouth, but not their nose, as if they hadn't realised they can actually inhale it inhale the virus through their nose. Last night on television, I saw someone who had it over their bottom lip. I don't know whether they thought they were protecting half their mouth. And then we have what our son calls the bearded look, where you just wear it around your neck. Um, anyway, we all know the correct way to wear it. Most of the time we manage okay. Sometimes our glasses still fog up. Now, what's all this nonsense got to do with young at heart? The masks we are wearing at the moment are to protect us from an unseen virus, coronavirus, COVID-19. And that is one of the four purposes, of, you know, it's been used down through the ages, I suspect, during the plagues, for example, and the Spanish flu but I didn't have photographs of them. Masks can serve other purposes and masks themselves can be invisible. We can all be guarded in our words and in our conduct 
for very good reasons. Quite early in life we learn not everything needs to be said as soon as we think of it. We are taught to think about the impact of our words on others and that is a good thing. When wearing an invisible mask is not good is when we wear it to conceal who we really are. How often do you hear on the TV news neighbours of someone who's committed a crime, usually a very serious crime? We had no idea he was. We had no idea she was. The word hypocrite, which has featured in sections of Matthew that Graham has spoken about in the last few months, it comes from the Greek word meaning to play a part. The Bible tells us, and I'm reading this section, that a hypocrite is someone who puts on a mask and pretends to be something he or she is not. Hypocrisy is to claim to know and follow certain beliefs, but to behave in a way that counteracts those beliefs. And sadly, that happens. But just in case we start thinking, as I was, about other people who might be hypocrites, some very public ones, listen to this warning, and I'm also reading. While we should have wisdom to discern words and actions that do not match, we also need to remember that God is the ultimate judge of character. Bible teaching on hypocrisy should serve to guide our own holiness, not to judge others. And I'm going to read in conclusion what James says. This is in chapter 3, verse 17. And it's a wonderful letter, quite a short letter, um, which, you know, I would encourage you to read. The wisdom from above is pure, first of all. It is also peaceful, gentle, and friendly. It is full of compassion and produces a harvest of good deeds. It is free from prejudice and hypocrisy. And may we all receive that wisdom in bucket loads. God bless you all. Thank you, Christine. Now, I know you've stepped down from the lectern, but uh, you're also listed to do our Bible reading today. So I'm going to uh, just open it for you here. John chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Sorry about this. It just It's become clear that having recorded Bible readings means some of you don't hear them clearly. We are working on improving the quality of the recordings, but for this week, you've got me again. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. And it's headed, The Word of Life. Before the world was created, the Word already existed. He was with God, and he was the same as God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without him. The Word was the source of light. The Word was the source of life. And this life brought light to mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has never put it out. God sent his messenger, a man named John, who came to tell people about the light so that all should hear the message and believe. He himself was not the light. He came to tell about the light. This was the real light. The light that comes into the world and shines on all mankind. 
The Word was in the world, and though God made the world through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own country, but his own people did not receive him. Some, however, did receive him and believed him. So he gave them the right to become God's children. They did not become God's children by natural means, that is, by being born as the children of a human father. God himself was their father. The word became a human being and, full of grace and truth, lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory which he received as the Father's only Son. John spoke about him. He cried out, This is the one I was talking about when I said, He comes after me, but he is greater than I am because he existed before I was born. Out of the fullness of his grace, he has blessed us all, giving us one blessing after another. God gave the law through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who is the same as God and is at the Father's side. He has made him known. May God bless his word to us. Thank you, Christine. So with these words, we discover ourselves in the Gospel of John. And I've used, as I said, uh, this image from uh, Gaudi's uh, Sagrada Familia in Barcelona uh, as a theme for uh, today's reflection. You can see as this is a photo taken from the inside, uh, looking up. This is the ceiling from the inside of Sagrada Familia. The columns, four columns at the center here holding up the, the, uh, the whole roof. Um, the columns are like trees, they open out, they, the capitals as it were, open out like the branches of a tree. It was a new idea that Gaudi had. And the, and the four main columns each have the name of a gospel and, and an image, a symbol of one of those gospels on it. So Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are represented here in holding up the edifice. And you can see that the image, of course, is a cruciform image. Sagrada Familia Barcelona. I encourage you just to look at it on the internet, to read about it, and to read about uh, Gaudi's vision for it, and how uh, he has incorporated so many things from the Bible in the stone of the building. There's a saying about John's Gospel, that it's a pool that's safe for a toddler to paddle in, but also deep enough for an elephant to swim in. I don't know if elephants swim. I can't say I've seen much of that. But it's a great idea, isn't it? It catches the amazing appeal of the book's simplicity and its profundity. Despite the imposing structure and ideas of the gospel, it makes you welcome. It deals with great themes like light and life and love. And these are all there in the, in the prologue which Christine has read. And as Tom Wright says, millions of us have found that as they come closer to this book, the friend above all friends is coming out to meet them. So let's take this then as our first great text of the Bible, John 1, 1 to 18. For those of, for those of viewers in England, I... One of the places I would love to go and haven't yet made it to is the Manchester University Library. Because in Manchester University Library, there is this tiny fragment of the Gospel of John. It's the oldest uh, piece of John's Gospel in existence. Uh, at a time when people were saying, oh, look, John's Gospel is different from the other Gospels. Uh, maybe it was written later, much later. Uh, we normally believe that uh, it was written possibly around the year 90. But people were saying, no, it must have been 200, 250 before it was written. And then this fragment was discovered in the sands of Egypt in the ruins of an ancient library. 
uh, a little papyrus fragment and it has on each side a part of John's Gospel. And it's dated from the year around 130, so just a generation after John. And this is the oldest part of the New Testament, the oldest part of any text of the New Testament in existence. It's called the John Rylands Fragment and it's in Manchester University Library. So there's something to go and see if you're in England sometime once COVID has, has left us behind. Well, great texts of the Bible, and there are th four things, I think, that stand out in the text. First of all, the words, in the beginning, they immediately catch our attention. And then the word, what does that mean? The word was, in the beginning was the word, and then became flesh, or a human being, as many modern translations put it. And then finally, the idea of the greatest story of all. So let's pick up uh, at the beginning. Uh, from the start, John is making it clear that what he has to say is connected to something that preceded him, a story that began somewhere else. His opening clearly refers back to the book of Genesis, the first book of the Jewish Holy Scriptures, the Torah, because it has the name in Hebrew which means in the beginning. That's literally what Genesis, uh, Genesis is the Greek name it, it received, but in Hebrew it means Bereshith, in the beginning. So since the middle, of course, of the Victorian era, Charles Darwin's origin of species has raised questions about human origins. And today it's common to assume that the backstory of uh, human, the human race is all about chance. Now, this created tensions for Charles Darwin when his eldest daughter, Annie, became ill. He was at that time thinking and writing about the survival of the fittest. And his oldest child is ill, and he's seeking a cure and taking her to different places in the hope, and placing her under the care of the best of Victorian physicians. But Annie didn't survive. She died in 1851, the decade in which he published his book. Charles recorded in his journal, We have lost the joy of the household and the solace of our old age. Oh, that she could now know how deeply, how tenderly we do still and shall ever love her dear, joyous face. So a great grief uh, to Charles Darwin. I, I went online and... Uh, checked this. I, I read a book some years ago called Annie's Box because one of Charles Darwin's grandchildren discovered this box which contained memorabilia of this little girl who died. And uh, it was clear that it was massive tension for Darwin as he was struggling with ideas about the meaning and the purpose of life to lose his child. And this is Annie's gravestone. And if you, if you look it up on the internet, you'll see that in addition to the bare facts about her life, her name, her birth and death, um, at the top of it, there are the three letters, I-H-S, which is the Latin abbreviation of the name Jesus. So here's a struggle going on in this man's life. Today, of course, uh, we're living a long time after even uh, Charles Darwin in, in 1965, French biochemist Jacques Monod won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. His book, published in 1970, is called Chance and Necessity. And it's not an easy read, but it has been influential in discussions of the origin and purpose of human life. He believes, as a result of evolution, driven that we are the result of evolution, driven by pure chance. Now, Christians believe that Genesis places a creator God at the very beginning. And that's where I would like to take you next week, although I'm feeling a little daunted at the prospect. But, but I think we have to say that one of the great texts of the Bible is what we're told at the beginning of the book of Genesis. But for today, we note that John's insight in this text, this great text of the Bible, is that the creator has been revealed and can be known. Which brings us to the Word. The Word 
we uh, translate uh, the word, the word can mean, it's the word logos in Greek, which comes into the English language and all the ologies that we study. It's the sort of the study of something, the reason of something, the purpose. So when we talk about the logos or the word being in the beginning, what John is telling us is that, uh, that the reason for something was revealed, has been revealed. He's saying that there's, there's, uh, ev if everything is a result of pure chance, then there's no purpose other than what we imagine might be a purpose. So good and bad become words that are totally rel relative and have no absolute meaning. They depend on what we or our tribe think is good or bad. In a world produced by chance alone, there can be no absolute right or wrong. At best, you might be lucky. The very idea that we inhabit a universe in which there is order, purpose and meaning arises from the biblical text. Genesis, which was familiar to John and to all Jews, was already an ancient document when he was writing the gospel. Let's move to something um, uh, that wasn't part of the ancient world, but was connected to it. Uh, you may have read Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Again, he was a Jew, he was a Holocaust survivor, and he was a professor of psychotherapy. And one of the things that he came to conclude and write about in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, is that people cannot live without meaning. We need a purpose. Now for John, writing all those years before Frankel, it was Jesus who brought that meaning and purpose to his life. And he wants others to experience that grace and truth that Jesus brought to his life. So John uses the Greek word logos, which can be translated as word or reason. And he tells us this, that the word was with God and the word was God. So here are two ideas which have had an enormous impact on uh, the Western world. The idea that God, uh, that the reason has to, for our, our, or the meaning of life is tied up with God and that yet it's tied up with someone who was uh, with God so that there is a sense of plurality within God the Godhead. That's an amazing idea. And of course, as a result of that, we have the whole concept of Trinity, which I mentioned last week because Matthew brings us to that point at the end of his gospel, where he talks about the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But for John, it was the encounter with, with Jesus that brought grace and truth to his life. That's the challenging thing. But this word, he says, became flesh. The logos became flesh. The Greek word is sarx. And it means literally flesh, uh, although it's often, as we heard this morning, uh, politely translated a human being. But flesh communicates a kind of earthiness with an undisguised mortality. It's about incarnation, incarne. The Latin word for flesh is carne, as in carnivore. And the incarnation is about, and this is another great theological idea. I cannot tell how he whom angels worship should set his love upon the sons of men. We, we, I suggested to you uh, that, that very first verse of that uh, great hymn goes on to say, but this I know, that he was born of Mary that Bethlehem's stable was his only home. So those are great ideas that have come into the Western world and uh, into Christianity and Christendom. And, and, and uh, Jesus, uh, John tells us, uh, came as flesh among us. And the word he goes on to use is the word tabernacle. He dwelt among us. That is, he put up his tent here. He camped here with us. It becomes clear that Jesus' mortal body, which is to become the climax of the whole narrative, draws on te terminology from the Old Testament. The actual word in Greek is uh, 
the word for a stretched out skin and, and it's the word that means tabernacle. He tabernacled among us. The term he uses then is the term for the tent of meeting in the book of Exodus. So here's another reference in John's text back to Genesis and the Torah to Exodus. This tent symbolized the presence of God in the midst of the Israelite camp. And what John is telling us is that that symbolized this moment when God became flesh and dwelt among us. We're being invited by John into the underlying story of the whole Bible to a pool of ideas not only big enough for an elephant to swim on, but to create a whole new vision for the world, an entire world of literature and science and medicine. You could, cannot begin to tell the, the scope of what has been written about this. Indeed, at the end of his gospel, we read, I suppose, the whole world couldn't contain the books that should be written. And that has been true. You might say, well, that doesn't sound up to date. Well, perhaps, uh, I'm not sure if these two men would bring it up to date, but when I was a school chaplain, I was privileged to have two men visit the school who had walked on the moon. They came at about 10-year intervals. Uh, one was Jim Irwin, and he was, uh, I think, uh, the eighth man to walk on the moon. And the other one was Charlie Duke, who was the 10th man to walk on the moon. And Jim Irwin uh, drove the lunar... The Lunar Rover, little car, battery-powered car that they left there. I remember him telling the boys that uh, if you go there, you'll find it now. It'll have a flat battery, but it costs six million dollars, so you know, don't don't laugh at it. Well, six million dollars was probably a lot of money when they took it to the moon. Both of them visited Scotch College, and both of them spoke of their Christian faith to the whole school in assembly. And Jim Irwin had established an organisation called the High Flight Foundation. This is from their web. Page. And this is the motto of the High Flight Foundation, that Jesus walking on earth is more important than man walking on the moon. John would agree with that, precisely. Why? This brings us to the greatest story ever told. John wants you and me to believe in and follow Jesus. He's quite open about this. He tells us so in chapter 20, verse 31. These things are written that you might believe. He's got something good, something wonderful. He's opening his treasure chest, as it were, and saying, look what we've discovered. Share it with us. It's for you as well as for us. Like every human being, Jesus had a family and a story. If life has meaning and purpose, we should expect to see meaning and purpose unfolding in the story of Jesus' family. And that's exactly what John is inviting us to do, to connect to the story of the Bible and to do so from the very beginning. Now, the Bible's a big book. I've said before, three quarters of a million words, and we shouldn't expect to understand it all at once. But during lockdown, I've chosen to try and complete a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle. Uh, this is the puzzle. It's, uh, it's the city of Melbourne in a map. I don't know if you can see it. This is the state of play yesterday. On the left, there's a, there's a blue patch. That's called Hobson's Bay, where Port Phillip Bay sort of narrows down as it, you come up towards the mouth of the Yarra River. I don't know if you can see the uh, sort of slim blue line across from the center down to the, headed towards the right. That's the Yarra River. I thought it would be easy to find the blue pieces, but it's more challenging, uh, especially by artificial light in the evening, to, to get the blue. You can possibly see Albert Park Lake in here. Uh, so I got that. And the MCG, you shouldn't find that too difficult to find. That was, that was there. So I got the, the border in place, and then I thought it would be easy, but it's quite challenging, believe me. But what I'm saying here is that having a copy of the big picture helps me find the place of each piece. And if you and I think of ourselves as pieces in the great picture that God is putting together, we discover there is a place for us. There is a purpose for us. In our story, we have connections that value, are valuable. We have things to share. We have people to support and encourage. 
we have a purpose in our own life. And I'm hoping that in this series of talks, we will explore great texts of the Bible and that will unearth the meaning and purpose that God has woven into this story. This story that's so often just wrapped up in, in between the covers on our shelves. And uh, my prayer is that as we do this, we will each discover and secure our own place within that story and discover the love that reaches to us, the grace and the truth that John sets before us. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, we bow before you and give thanks that you uh, have given us this awesome message through John that in Christ Jesus you became flesh and for a time camped among us. Saviour, may your profound commitment to rescue and restore us inspire our love and motivate and energise our daily work. Forgive us, O oh Lord, that we're often unresponsive to the shocking inhumanity and oppression that so many of your children endure. Give us eyes to see what you are calling us to in these days. Make us agents of change in the service of the Saviour. Transform us into peacemakers, so may your kingdom come. We pray for all affected by the crisis in aged care, the residents, their families and the staff. As a church, Kirk Bray is particularly close to our hearts. And in the quiet, we name before you those we know who live there. As COVID-19 continues a silent and deadly presence in our communities, we long for effective treatments and vaccines. We pray for the almost 1,000 infected health workers in Victoria. We ask for your blessing on all who are working hard to restore health. We mourn with those who have lost loved ones and grieve for them. We lament the loss of health, but also the loss of productive work and the ability to earn an income to provide for dependents, even as we are grateful for the cooperation of governments in seeking to suppress the virus and minimizing the financial impact on families and business. We unite to pray for the people of Beirut who have experienced the terrible trauma of such a deadly urban explosion. Help us to be generous and play our part in supporting the bereaved and the, the injured and children orphaned in the blast. We know it is the poor who suffer most in this pandemic and that this is not only so in Australia but especially so in the poorer countries. Help us to participate with Barnabas Fund, Langham Partnership, TIER, World Vision, Save the Children and the many other agencies that extend our reach to impoverished brothers and sisters. These things we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray and to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift upon you the light of his countenance and give you peace.